Welcome uh, to this side event of the CFS 48. Good morning, good afternoon, and every evening, everybody from around the world. I am Etienne Azla from the CIRAD, and uh, I am a co convener of the TPP with Fergus Sinclair from ICRAF. We are extremely pleased to welcome you at this side event of the CFS 48, <clears throat> named uh, Addressing Knowledge and Implementation Gaps on Agroecological Transitions a way forward for research and development through the transformative partnership platform, the TPP. So we are close to 200 participants now. And at this side event, uh, there will be uh, two panels to launch this TPP initiative. The first panel will be, what is the political demand for agroecology? And I introduce the panelists in a moment. And the second panel moderated by Fergus will be the transdisciplinary research response, a new way forward with the agroecology partnership, transformative partnership platform, the TPP. These two panels will foster discussion of key knowledge and implementation needs and gaps ahead in line with the HLP reports and outcomes of the CSS policy convergence process. And it will allow also a brief presentation of the TPP, of the initiative within, within it, and a discussion with different uh, stakeholders and the audience. Few technical points before starting the panel. First of all, there will be interpretation in two languages, in three languages, French, English, and Spanish. And you can find the button at the bottom of your screen, Zoom screen, interpretation, you choose the panel. All the, the sound will be translated, only the Q&A won't be translated. Um, otherwise, uh, you can uh, choose the, the channel of your own language. During the panel, during each panel, we will run two polls. Uh, they will be launched at the beginning of each Q&A session. And uh, you're welcome to participate to it. The interaction with the audience for each panel will be through Q&A window. And uh, there, there won't be possibility to uh, uh, speak uh, by yourself, but just write you, your questions. Uh, these questions will animate the panel, will be forwarded to the panelists, and you can vote on these questions to, to if you agree with them. So the most vote you have, uh, it will be facilitated and moderated through the panelists. And in any case, we will keep these questions for the future discussion about the, the TPP in the future. So in the first panel, we will have a video of His Excellency, Mr. Gotabaya Rajapaksek, Executive President of the, so the Democratic Socialist Republic of Sri Lanka, and uh, uh, Mr. Um, Chris uh, Dharmakirti will be with the panel to represent Sri Lanka as well. Uh, but uh, I would like now to pass the floor to uh, Mrs. Céline uh, Jurgensen, Permanent Representative of France to the FAO, we will do the introductory remarks. So the floor is yours, Mr. Jugensen, for five minutes. Bonjour à tous. Merci infiniment, Monsieur Veslin. Je tiens à saluer Son Excellence, le Président du Sri Lanka, les ambassadeurs de Suisse et du Sénégal, Madame Eloafi, la première scientifique en chef de la FAO, Madame Clavry de Saint-Martin, du CIRAD, les représentants de l'Union européenne, du CJIR, de la société civile dans son ensemble. La France promeut l'agroécologie en France, en Europe et dans les pays du Sud. L'agroécologie est pour nous un levier central pour transformer les systèmes alimentaires. Les dix éléments de l'agroécologie adopté par la FAO en 2019 et les 13 principes d'agroécologie énoncés dans le 14e rapport du High Level Panel of Experts, HLPE, du Comité de la Sécurité Alimentaire, interface sciences politiques de premier ordre, forment un cadre très utile pour appuyer les pays dans cette transformation. Pour la France, il est urgent de transformer nos systèmes actuels vers des systèmes alimentaires durables et résilients qui permettent l'accès de tous à une alimentation de qualité saine, sûre, diversifiée et produite de manière durable. Et la pandémie de COVID-19 n'a fait que 
confirmer et rendre plus nécessaire encore cette, cette transformation. Le sommet du secrétaire général des Nations unies sur les systèmes alimentaires, qui aura lieu en septembre prochain, avec un pré-sommet à Rome fin juillet, doit être l'occasion de progresser collectivement vers cet objectif et de favoriser la diffusion et la mise en œuvre à grande échelle des recommandations politiques du CSA sur les pratiques agroécologiques et autres approches innovantes. La France est en effet convaincue que l'adoption de pratiques agroécologiques à l'échelle mondiale et la mise en œuvre des recommandations du CSA apporteront une contribution majeure à la réalisation des objectifs de développement durable. À ce titre, la France souhaite réaffirmer son soutien aux agences romaines pour maintenir et renforcer les programmes dédiés à la promotion de l'agroécologie et participer à la mise en œuvre des recommandations du CSA. Un changement de paradigme est nécessaire pour qu'une approche agroécologique viennent se substituer à la révolution verte des dernières décennies pour relever les défis climatiques, environnementaux et sociaux auxquels nous sommes tous confrontés, au nord comme au sud. L'agroécologie est de ce point de vue une approche qui s'appuie sur les écosystèmes naturels, qui combine les connaissances locales et scientifiques et se concentre sur les interactions entre les plantes, les animaux, les humains et l'environnement. Les pratiques agroécologiques favorisent le recyclage des nutriments, le stockage du carbone dans les sols et la conservation de la biodiversité. Elles améliorent la fertilité des sols et leur rétention en eau, essentielle à une bonne productivité. Elles favorisent aussi la diversité des espèces cultivées. Elle donne également un point important une plus grande autonomie aux agriculteurs en réduisant leur dépendance aux intrants et donc leur charge d'exploitation. La, résil la résilience face aux aléas climatiques, mais aussi économiques et sanitaires, est ainsi nettement améliorée. La France souhaite donc accompagner les pays en développement, en particulier les pays les moins avancés dans la transition agroécologique. C'est dans ce contexte que l'accélérateur de la Grande Muraille Verte a été lancé en janvier dernier par le président de la République française, M. Emmanuel Macron, lors du One Planet Summit, avec un financement de 12 milliards d'euros au total pour la période 2021-2025 et avec le soutien de la FAO que je remercie. Ceci est important pour lutter contre la dégradation des terres, la perte de biodiversité, et pour renforcer la résilience climatique, mais aussi les moyens de subsistance et la sécurité alimentaire dans les zones rurales des 11 pays sahéliens concernés de l'Atlantique à la Corne de l'Afrique. La France souhaite également promouvoir un contexte favorable à l'adoption des pratiques agroécologiques par les agriculteurs familiaux du monde entier à travers un meilleur accès au financement et à la formation professionnelle. Il est important d'encourager l'investissement du secteur privé, responsable socialement et du point de vue environnemental, dans l'agriculture et les systèmes alimentaires. Et ceci s'est par exemple concrétisé récemment par la tenue du sommet « Finance en commun », grâce notamment à l'Agence française de développement et le FIDA, en novembre dernier à Paris, et la création d'une banque publique, d'une coalition pardon, de banques publiques du développement menée par le FIDA. Cette coalition vise à renforcer les investissements dans les systèmes alimentaires pour assurer un meilleur accès des petits exploitants et des PME agroalimentaires au financement. Enfin, la connaissance est bien sûr un élément central en matière d'agroécologie. C'est pourquoi la France a porté et financé, dans le cadre de son partenariat avec le CGIAR, signé en début d'année, la création de la plateforme de partenariat en agroécologie TPP, 
Transformative Partnership Platform en Agroécologie, une initiative que nous mettons à l'honneur aujourd'hui. C'est un projet collaboratif monté par le CIRAD, que je remercie, et les centres du CJR, que je salue, en collaboration avec les acteurs locaux et plus particulièrement les centres de recherche nationaux des pays du Sud. Je suis donc ravie aujourd'hui de participer au lancement de cette plateforme. Elle a une vocation mondiale en Afrique, en Asie, dans les pays d'Amérique latine. Elle rassemble des partenaires qui œuvrent à la transformation des systèmes alimentaires à travers l'identification des lacunes en matière de connaissances, la documentation de bonnes pratiques fondées sur des données scientifiques étayées et la promotion du dialogue entre la recherche et les décideurs politiques. Elle sera une contribution utile et importante au sommet sur les systèmes alimentaires. En conclusion, nous avons besoin de la mobilisation et de l'investissement de tous pour promouvoir l'adoption de bonnes pratiques agroécologiques à l'échelle internationale. Cette plateforme sera l'un des instruments clés qui doivent permettre aux agriculteurs du monde et aux décideurs politiques d'avoir accès à des informations et à une documentation de qualité pour la mise à l'échelle de ces bonnes pratiques agroécologiques. Je vous souhaite d'excellents débats et je tiens encore à me féliciter du lancement de cette plateforme. Je vous remercie. À vous. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to address you today at the Agroecology event of the United Nations Committee on World Food Security. Climate change is one of the most serious issues humanity faces. Mitigating its impact requires urgent collective action from all, all countries. Individual nations must devise means to adapt to life in a changing climate. Ensuring food security through agroecological adaptation is an essential part of this. If we are to preserve the health of our planet and ensure human sustainability, governments the world over must not hesitate to adopt bold policies. Such policies should support ecological conservation, help combat the loss of biodiversity, and enable people to achieve their economic aspirations in more sustainable ways. In April of this year, the government of Sri Lanka banned the import of artificial fertilizers pesticides and weedicides. Our decision took into account broader ecological issues as well as significant public health concerns. Use of artificial fertilizers and agrochemicals has been associated with the rise of non-communicable diseases amongst the general public. They have also long been identified with the high incidences of chronic illness in the heartland of Sri Lanka, where they have been overused for decades. Largely due to aggressive marketing by the agrochemical lobby and a lack of education amongst farmers, it is estimated that nearly 80% of the nitrogen fertilizer used in Sri Lanka is wasted. Excess fertilizer contaminates the land and seeps into the groundwater. It worsens soil degradation and water pollution and increases greenhouse gas emissions. My government's decision to ban imports of artificial fertilizer and agrochemicals will therefore enable a long needed national transition to a healthier and more ecologically sound 
system of organic agriculture. We are aware that there will be teething problems during this transition. These include constraints in domestic production and supply of organic alternatives as well as adverse public perceptions arising from the ban. However, as leaders, it is our responsibility to take decisive action despite the challenges we will face. If we hesitate to make decisions, essential initiatives such as this will always remain confined to the realm of discussion. The government of Sri Lanka is ready to support our farmers and agriculture based industries as our agroecological transition takes place. Support mechanisms include subsidies to farmers as well as the purchase of paddy by the government at a guaranteed price if wheels are reduced temporarily. We would greatly appreciate the support of the international community including multilateral organizations, individual governments, climate funds, technical experts and bodies as well as businesses and investors to strengthen our domestic capacity in organic farming. Increasing production of biofertilizer, promoting adoption of organic soil enhancement technologies and management techniques, knowledge sharing on improved agricultural practices and strengthening of research and development into organic agriculture are some of the ways in which this support could be structured. I am confident that Sri Lanka's decision to ban imports of artificial fertilizers and agrochemicals will pave the way for a greener economy and a healthier society while supporting our aspiration in terms of food security in the long term. I further hope that Sri Lanka's initiative will inspire other governments to take similarly bold action for the betterment of their nations, their citizens, the health of our planet and for our future generations. Thank you. Thank you both to France and Sri Lanka for this very motivating address. And uh, with that, I would like to open the panel and introduce the two panelists, uh, Mr. Pio Venobst, Ambassador, uh, Permanent Mission of Switzerland to the UN in Rome, and Mr. Madiantal, Advisor to the Senate Ambassador uh, in Rome, Mr. Papsek, who was not able to join us today. So I would like to uh, ask uh, them to take the floor for five minutes, and then we will be joined by Mr. Chris uh, Dharmakirti, who will represent Sri Lanka in this panel. Please, the floor is yours, Mr. Pio Venbust. Uh, please, could you uh, close you, down your, your screen, your camera, and we'll open the camera for the panel. Just Mr. Pio will keep your camera on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. May I start? Yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. So, agroecology, it's amazing. Good afternoon, by the way, and good morning, good evening, it depends where you are connected from. Um, it's amazing too that we realize after so many years that the term agroecology is still provoking a lot of emotions. And recently we've been going through this as if it, we were talking about something almost mysterious, almost uh, esoteric. And then, uh, strange enough, the Swiss, we are known for being quite pragmatic and concrete. And actually, we have been working and, 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 and using agroecological principles in, in our agricultural systems and in, in our food system for, for many, many years now. So many the years that in order to prepare ourselves for the, for the United Nations Food System Summit 21, the, the committee that is advising the federal government on food, in food issues um, 
prepared uh, papers, Pathways to Advanced Agroecology, Overcoming Challenges and Contributing to Sustainable Food System Transformation. This was prepared based on on evidence coming out from uh, uh, several years of work. And there are a lot of institutions, also included in uh, Swiss-based research institutions that have been working on, uh, on this. And, and it's not for just for, uh, for a reason that um, it's not just an esoteric issue. It's an issue that uh, why we Swiss have been working on, and we keep on working and we believe in agri agroecological patterns because our society, it's very urbanized. If you take away the mountains area where we don't live, basically, but our country is densely populated. And so production and consumption of food is very highly intertwined. There is, there is consumers and producers are in, in discussion daily, basically, how to advance and how to proceed further in order to make sustainable, more ecologically sound, um, and also uh, for the determinants of health, production and food system in, uh, in, uh, that, are, that are sustainable. Now, the point is this, that uh, while uh, in Switzerland, I would say we are pretty much rapidly uh, moving, um, whether, we, whether based on beliefs or whether based on, on, on concrete experience, just to name, for instance, 30 years ago, um, agroecological products, organic products, were having hardly access to the market. Now, 20% of the food consumption in Switzerland is organic based production. So um, say that what we definitely realize is that all the research, all the knowledge we are we developed in Switzerland um, cannot be simply transferred in the way we might used to do in the past with positive intentions, but, um, but we need another connectivity, another way to discuss and to, and to connect with um, with uh, with the world basically on on these issues and therefore what we think is that uh, the models for research for development need to be rethought um, we need to find a new kinds of uh, types and spaces of structures to exchange among interested and among practitioners in the world and we need to work and be focused on long-term perspectives. Um, therefore, we think that, uh, that is, this initiative, the Transformative Partnership Platform, it's, it's a very, very valuable initiative because exactly this is what we need in this moment. Knowledge and evidence-based knowledge is there. Now it's a point to how we make this accessible to everyone and how this can be adapted in a way that is not prescriptive from one country to another or in a, in a classic north-south relations or anything like this, but how different protectioner can be based, based on their own reality can make of use and adapt this kind of uh, knowledge that is coming out in order to have a real transformational movement um, into the future of the food systems. And this is where actually some of our um, actors, the institutions, in this specific case, the Swiss Agency for Development Cooperation, the Global Program of Food Systems, is actually supporting this and in, in other initiatives that are um, bring with the idea of mainstreaming agroecological principle within the food systems. And with this, I thank you. And I, and I close here my intervention in case you would need some me for some q a later on thank you thank you very much ambassador pio i would like to give the floor now to mr madianto for his address the floor is your mr madianto oui allô allô oui tout le monde m'entend oui vous pouvez y aller vous avez cinq minutes merci à monsieur le président sri lankais merci à toutes et à tous tout d'abord je voudrais vous dire que notre présence ici témoigne de tout l'intérêt que le Sénégal accorde à l'organisation de cet important événement parallèle de la 48e session du CSA et ensuite présenter à tout le monde 
les excuses de son Excellence l'ambassadeur du Sénégal en Italie, près le Quirinal, docteur Papa Abdoulaïsek, qui avait toujours bien souhaité être de la partie, mais malheureusement aujourd'hui, il a un rendez-vous déjà programmé depuis très longtemps. Je m'en vais donc vous faire lecture de son message. D'emblée, je voudrais exprimer mes remerciements sincères aux organisateurs de ce site event et les féliciter d'avoir eu cette heureuse initiative de réunir différents panélistes pour échanger sur l'agroécologie et particulièrement sur comment résoudre les lacunes en matière de connaissances et de mise en œuvre sur les transitions agroécologiques. Cela dit, je voudrais me fonder sur mon expérience pour convoquer quelques convictions fortes. Première conviction, pour nous, l'équation fondamentale, c'est de nourrir l'Afrique sans la détruire. Et nourrir l'Afrique sans la détruire signifie d'une part concilier les enjeux socio-économiques, les enjeux environnementaux et les enjeux de santé publique. Et d'autre part, cela signifie aussi accepter que l'agriculture de demain doit exister et elle doit certainement être meilleure que celle d'aujourd'hui. Cela doit se traduire par une solidarité intergénérationnelle qui devrait nous permettre d'avoir un héritage environnemental de qualité. La deuxième conviction est que pour nourrir l'Afrique, il faut certes augmenter la production agricole, mais cette augmentation de la production agricole africaine n'est pas, de notre point de vue, une condition nécessaire et suffisante pour régler les problèmes de consommation. L'exercice s'avère beaucoup plus complexe parce qu'il s'agit de construire avec célérité, efficacité et efficience une offre agricole qui soit stable, qui soit au mieux suffisante en quantité et satisfaisante en qualité. Cette offre agricole doit aussi être rémunératrice pour les producteurs et supportable également par le budget des consommateurs les plus pauvres. Donc, un simple dopage de la production agricole africaine est absolument insuffisant pour nourrir l'Afrique. Il faut alors plus pour assurer la durabilité des capacités des bases productives de nos écosystèmes et un équilibre biologique de l'environnement. Troisième et dernière conviction est qu'il faut fortifier le savoir et le savoir-faire africain endogène par une recherche scientifique de qualité, car l'agroécologie n'est pas allergique à toute forme d'innovation technologique. En exemple, le Sénégal a lancé des projets fondés sur l'agroécologie. Ce sont des projets qui sont sous l'appellation de gestion intégrée de la production et des prédateurs. Avec ces projets, on s'est rendu compte que les rendements ont augmenté de plus ou moins 40% et on réduit de façon, euh, de façon significative l'utilisation des pesticides. C'est dire donc qu'on peut faire de l'agroécologie et avoir une bonne productivité. En définitive, il ne s'agit pas de faire table rase de tout ce qui existe. Il s'agit plutôt et surtout de considérer les principes directeurs de l'agroécologie dans le cadre des systèmes alimentaires durables et résilients à inventer. C'est pourquoi le sommet sur les systèmes alimentaires devrait véritablement permettre d'avoir un meilleur repositionnement de l'agroécologie afin que le monde puisse se nourrir sans se détruire, tout en préservant effectivement ses bases productives. Donc, le Sénégal encourage tous les participants, car il n'est pas facile de promouvoir de nouvelles technologies, mais à force de sensibiliser les uns et les autres, nous allons tous prendre conscience de la nécessité d'approfondir de telles approches. Au-delà de tout, il est important de préciser que les agricultures du monde vont se développer grâce à une diversité des approches. Par conséquent, L'approche 
agroécologique mérite respect et considération. Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, M. Tal. Thank you very much, all the panelists. We are over 300 now. And for this panel of the political demand, I, I, I would like uh, you to uh, first uh, ask your question in the Q&A uh, session. There will be a poll launch about the importance of the knowledge gap compared to the implementation gap. And I would like just to start the panelists uh, with a round of question about the role of science in this domain. So uh, maybe I would like to ask first Mr. Pio Venups about what is the new way of doing research uh, to attend your uh, expectation from science? Is there a, a, a real knowledge gap? You, you mentioned that uh, we know the urgency, we know the agroecology is, is working. So how we do expect the science role to evolve to, to attend this uh, expectation from political demand? Thank you. Thank you for the question. So in the past, we used to you used to do research related to uh, to a product or to a production pattern, uh, or on the other hand, looking at the health related issues of something specific, but they were not necessarily related one to each other. Uh, now the point is that you don't do research just through, through researchers anymore. Research, you, you involve consumers, you involve a lot of different actors, um, including uh, powers, local powers, municipalities, and so on. So research is becoming a, a, a much more uh, complex, but also I would say very interesting way of, uh, of, uh, of uh, bringing in evidence, evidence that is also related to, for instance, policy making, or related to some other issues than the, the specific um, productivity related matter. Um, when we are talking about uh, true cost, uh, getting to the true costs of food, this implies all sorts of different ways of doing research. And I would say that tendentially, those institutions that have been working on agro agroecology and agroecological issues, they've been already working in a systemic manner. So they have, there they have an edge, independently whether then it, uh, you find all the results that you are looking for, because more complex, of course, and there will be more possible solution. And by the way, just to answer rapidly to the question, the Q&A that it was addressed to me about the referendum, this Sunday, the Swiss population, because of our direct democracy system, is going to vote on, um, on initiatives that include in those one that wants to ban pesticides used for agriculture. Whether this is going to go through or not, whether the, the, the population is going to accept it or not, the mere fact that we are at this moment not only discussing, but voting every citizen, including the one that is urbanized, not working, not, not being in the in the, in the food chain, if you want, apart from being the consumer, that has to say whether they want this or not. This implies that there is already a change that is a systemic change that is happening. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mr. Winbert. So I would like to pass to Mrs. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chris Darmatirti, who is uh, the chair of the UN Sustainable Development Goal Council. What uh, just uh, Mr. Winbert said uh, echoes to what your president said about the banning of, of imports of uh, uh, pesticide and, and uh, fertilizer. What would be your expectation in Sri Lanka about research, about the real knowledge gap to implement and to facilitate this transition? Thank you very much. I think as our Excellency the President uh, said in his address, we have had experience with a lot of externalities with respect to the health impact because the farmers of Sri Lanka in North uh, last decade have been getting afflicted with chronic kidney disease, which has been a substantial uh, impact on the farmers' lives because their life expectancy gets reduced to five years unless they have a kidney donor. And in effect, uh, the farmers in Sri Lanka are uh, affected because and other uh, sort of uh, substances that have been coming down the irrigation channels. 
And when we did certain research that uh, from the geographic areas that these waters were flowing, there was no naturally occurring cadmium in the highlands. So clearly it was getting introduced either in the form of the uh, uh, fertilizers that were obviously substandard in terms of the, the quality. And clearly the, uh, the toxins coming from the pesticides and creating a lot of non-communicable diseases in the drink water rivers that the urban cities have been uh, drawing their water from. So it's a massive health impact that we have suffered in the last years. Now, the research side, unfortunately, uh, if you look at the uh, impact of the, uh, even we have a fertilizer secretariat and a standards institute, it's random samples of fertilizer uh, that's been tested. So there is no real proper governance in the way that one can find out uh, the quality of the imported uh, inputs that come into agriculture. And also uh, we've been having uh, difficulties in, in the type of testing laboratory equipment and the level of uh, soil testing capacity across the country because it's a substantial uh, investment and also there's vari variability in the type of laboratories that uh, are conducting these tests. So in terms of the input that countries like Sri Lanka requires is uh, perhaps uh, gene sequencing and, and much better higher quality testing and faster throughput of uh, uh, multiple samples, not just one or two, but you need to uh, sample all the agroecological zones in the country. And, and to do that, that's a substantial effort. So, so we need to upscale the throughput of the laboratory facilities. Thank you, Chris. That's that's really clear. So it's a, it's a kind of a new way of doing research, and it's feeding the scaling of, of the, the the discovery and the knowledge. Uh, yeah, because we have been looking at doing a, a complete baseline dashboard, which is the initiative that the president wants us to do, so that we have an evidence based approach to know the quality of the soil, the contamination level of the soil the quality of the water, irrigated water, the contamination level of the irrigation water. And because we have had an irrigation system under the Mahaveli system, the farmers get their water from a separate input and the output of the water going out from that farmland goes off on a separate canal. So we can test the input and the output of the quality of the water and then incentivize the farmers and also penalize the farmers if indeed they're adding any contaminants. So that's a very good example of, of uh, policy, public policy yeah. to favor the, the transition. So I, I would like to, to say to the audience, we are almost 300 now, please put your question in the Q&A session. We will keep them in memory. We might not be able to answer that now because, uh, because of the lack of time, but uh, there, there were several questions about how to join this effort, how to join this platform. Uh, we will treat that in the second panel. Now I, I would like to turn to uh, Ms. Celine Jorgensen and um, ask her about the, the, the political demand and, and the FAO uh, context with the, the club of countries, friend to agroecology. So we heard Sri Lanka, France, Senegal, and, and, and Switzerland, but uh, there, there are other countries, there are many countries um, expressing political demand for the agroecological transition. Could you comment on that, Ms. Uh, Jorgensen, and how you, do you see the international cooperation around this transition uh, can operate? Merci beaucoup à vous pour, pour cette question. Vous l'avez souligné, plusieurs États sont impliqués en faveur de l'agroécologie. Il y a encore des, des questionnements. Cependant, l'ambassadeur de Suisse les a, les a évoqués. Et donc, il est particulièrement important de poursuivre nos efforts. On le fait naturellement à la FAO. On le fait au sein du groupe des amis de l'agroécologie, qui est présidé par mon ami l'ambassadeur du Sénégal. On le fait dans toutes les enceintes et c'est la raison pour laquelle aussi le sommet des Nations Unies sur les systèmes alimentaires nous semble un moment intéressant pour renforcer la coopération avec d'autres pays, avec d'autres acteurs, parce que c'est important d'écouter les pays, mais également les acteurs locaux 
les agriculteurs, la société civile, la recherche pour donc renforcer cette coopération au niveau international et mobiliser euh, pour ne pas perdre la dynamique que nous avons commencé à, à lancer. Donc, les efforts se poursuivent. Euh, naturellement, nous appelons euh, tous, nos, tous nos collègues, les, les différents pays, euh, à continuer à travailler avec nous. On le fait aussi avec les partenaires européens, naturellement. Hein. L'Europe a adopté un New Green Deal. Et donc, c'est important aussi de rappeler cette dimension européenne forte. Et euh, nous souhaitons poursuivre et amplifier cette dynamique lors du sommet des systèmes alimentaires. Merci à vous. Merci beaucoup. Uh, I, I'm going to ask a last question to Mr. Tal be, before the panel stops. Uh, view from Senegal, the political demand for knowledge, uh, for science, uh, could, you, could you show us how the international cooperation can play a role in these knowledge gaps and Uh, how do you see scientific cooperation around this agroecological transition, Mr. Tal? Monsieur Tal, voulez-vous que je répète la question en français? La question était, Monsieur Tal, si vous pouvez vous brancher, de, comment vous voyez la, la coopération scientifique vue du Sénégal, vue d'un pays du Sud, dans cette exigence de transition agroécologique? Je pense que M. Tal n'est plus branché. Donc, je, je, je vais reposer la question. I'm going to direct the question to, to Pio Venburst. Um, how do you see this international cooperation in terms of science? Before we pass uh, uh, the, to the second panel with the answer of the TPP, how do you see this international cooperation and the role that Switzerland can play in it? It's to support the initiatives that are local. I would say in a, in a very bold sentence is that uh, we've got a lot of knowledge, of course, but why not make sure that, for instance, the Swiss Agency for Development Corporation and others actually support the initiatives that are um, taken up by, for instance, the Sri Lankan government. That is a bold, a very, and this implies very complex Um, uh, the complexity of the research related to this it will be very, very big. So why not following a political intention, which is a very strong one, with all the support we can give through our Uh, through our uh, knowledge-based platform, including this one. And just as a complement for the one of the Q&A question, um, we would not like to mix agroecology with uh, trade. It's not by banning uh, products moving, but it's by giving the real true cost and true values to products that this will address also the trading issues. When Chris was talking about the health-related issues, This is the true values that still is, has to be completely unfold in, into the, and analyzed into the foods. Um, and this will be the answer for the future. You can import in the future your avocado, but then you will have to pay the cost for it, the full cost for it. Thank including you very the, much. Thank, thank you. you. Very much. So with this, I would like to close this first panel and pass the floor to Fergus, my colleague Fergus, co-convener of the TPP. Thank you, Fergus, for taking the second panel. Okay, thank you, Etienne, for um, such a clear articulation of a really strong political demand for uh, agroecology. In this second panel, which what we're going to do is to start addressing uh, or look at what we can do to address that. I'm going to introduce the transformative partnership platform uh, and then Uh, uh, Elizabeth is going to uh, um, uh, continue and, and uh, show a couple of the uh, initiatives that are currently underway. And then we have um, the civil society mechanism of, of CFS, who are going to, to, to give their perspective. And then a young uh, entrepreneur from Kenya uh, um, trying to set up agroecological businesses is going to give us a sort of a uh, fresh young idea from uh, the, the perspective uh, uh, of somebody trying to, to, to get things done. So let me start um, by introducing the transformative uh, partnership platform on, on agroecology. Next slide. 
Now, this grew out of the HLPE and the Global Commission on Adaptation Reports and Dialogues, um, for example, at FAO and around Biovision's Money Flows Report, and between the French Research Institutes and the CGAR. A coalition was formed, including FAO, UNET, Biovision, Switzerland, France, the CGR, it's now been joined by TMG, IFAD, um, and AFA, um, together with many national partners to address knowledge and implementation gaps that are constraining agroecological transformation. Now, the TPP is demand-led. Uh, I should have the next slide, but I don't see it. Uh, thank you. Um, the, the TPP is demand-led, driven by the needs of the farmers' organizations, civil society, and national and local governments in the places where the work is done. So you read this diagram from the inside out. It convenes global partners around this agenda, bringing greater coherence to their agroecology efforts and has a fast developing science policy interface and capacity development facility to ensure that its work is transformative. It's governed by a steering committee comprising representatives of donors, providers and civil society and farmer organizations in the global south. Next slide. Now the TPP uses the 13 HLPE agroecological principles to guide its work. Seven of these principles, the lower ones in the circle, are mainly concerned with agroecosystem management to encourage farming that is in harmony with nature and confers resilience. The other six in the upper part of the circle concern whole food systems and are fundamental for catalyzing and sustaining uh, transformative change in relation to governance, social uh, uh, and economic realities. The need for these principles to be applied simultaneously has led to agroecology manifesting as a science, as a set of practices and as a series of social movements. And widespread transformative change is only likely to occur where we can bring these three manifestations um, to work together. Next slide. As the president of Sri Lanka indicated in his address, getting to a transformed food system is going to require big changes. And there are many agroecological transition pathways from where we start to where we want to get to, operating in different contexts. Now, Gleesman's famous transition levels assume a starting point of industrial agriculture or green revolution agriculture and a need to redesign farming away from the use of environmentally disruptive chemicals on monocultures towards farming more in harmony with nature. Now, this pertains in much of Asia, Latin America and Europe, but in much of sub-Saharan Africa, where the green, green revolution has not had traction, farmers uh, may be using very few inputs and have low yields accompanied by land degradation and want agroecological intensification using biodiversity and natural processes such as biological nitrogen fixation to increase productivity without negative environment and social externalities, generating decent rural employment and empowering women. Next slide. While we see here intensific uh, the one before, while we see here intensification gradients, the previous slide, yeah, while we see here intensification gradients of biodiversity, dependence on natural processes, knowledge, labor, and capital at the agroecosystem level. Food production is driven by demand for consumers and food system transformation requires changes in consumption patterns and actors throughout food value chains to have agency in articulating their preference for sustainably and ethically produced food that is both nutritious and culturally appropriate. Next slide. So far, the TPP has eight working domains that have been identified. And work proceeds by developing a common protocol and then using this across cases in contrasting context. And the next presentation will show this in respect of socioeconomic viability of agroecological practices across Africa. Next slide. 
The metrics domain is a good example uh, of how things work within the TPP. This is funded by the European Union International Partnerships, and it implements recommendation two of the CFS policy convergence process uh, around agroecology to establish and apply comprehensive performance measurement and monitoring frameworks. And following the HLP report, developing holistic metrics at four scales, that of the field, the farm or livelihood, the landscape, community or territory in, 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 in uh, the Francophone context, and the food system scale. Now for practices, there needs to be a focus on looking at performance of options across contexts. For livelihoods, we need to focus on the total factor productivity of those livelihoods and their resilience. For landscapes, we need to be able to uh, look at trade-offs and synergies amongst different ecosystem services. And then for food systems, we need a modified form of ecological footprint connecting consumption and production that takes into account the regenerative or degradative nature of production. Next slide. The TPP has a principle of building on what has gone before and the ongoing work of partners, rather than repeating or competing. So FAO, SDC, Biovision, the University of Coventry and IFAD have all developed and used agroecology assessment frameworks, perhaps the best known being FAO's TAPE which assesses how, how agroecological different systems are on the 10 dimensions defined by the FAO elements. BioVision's facts is similar, but it uses the 13 HLP principles. What the TPP metrics project will do is bring all this together, develop, develop from these and other resources, for example, the adaptation metrics platform, holistic metrics for agricultural performance at the four scales, that if internationally deployed, will allow agroecological approaches to be evaluated on a level playing field with others. Next slide. As it goes forward, the TPP will contribute, sorry, the T, uh, as it goes forward, the TPP will contribute to create a level playing field for agroecological approaches to be taken up. It has aligned projects as well as projects developed uh, in the uh, program itself. So, for example, connected to metrics, we have uh, a project uh, led by CCAFs in the CGR on inclusive digital tools and another um, uh, from uh, WLE looking at um, private sector engagement. We have a big GCF project in Sri Lanka um, looking at ecosystem based adaptation um, and we have uh, a co-impact design grant for system change um, around uh, natural farming in Andhra Pradesh. Next slide. As it goes forward, the TPP will contribute to creating a level playing field for agroecological approaches to be taken up, embrace the complexity needed to transition to co-created locally relevant agriculture and food systems, and enable the horizontal integration across sectors, and the vertical integration across scales that's required to translate national and international commitments under UNFCCC, CBD, UNCCD, and FR100 into meaningful action on the ground, following the Paternoster principle, where you work bottom up and top down at the same time to achieve widespread transformation. And now let me introduce Elizabeth Claverie de Saint-Martin, Director General for Research and Strategy at CIRAD, who will further elaborate on two, COP, two key projects within the TPP. Thank you very much, Fergus. I will try to, to be brief because you've already uh, pointed out the main points I will develop in the project. So as Fergus has just said, um, the TPP is an original initiative to address this double challenge. First, knowledge gap, then implementation gap. And um, the TPP has already developed a significant portfolio of projects. And I want just to illustrate by touching on two projects. The first one you have on the screen, which is the project viability, and then TAPS. So the viability project is one of the first research priority addressed by the TPP. It started in 2020 and hopefully would end in 2022. 
and uh, it's built on a very large partnership between six CTR um, center institution. You will have them in another slide, so I don't detail them. Two French institutions, Sihad and Yuhai, Cornell University, and BioVision. So it aims to better understand the social economic viability uh, uh, of agroecological practices and their livelihood system impacts across various environment and demographic in Africa. This is an African project. The key question indeed is whether we have tools to address the environmental outcome of agriculture, but it's not so easy to have a generic method to assess those social economical aspects when it comes to income, creation of jobs, social impacts. And this is what we aim to work on. And this is applied to a large diversity of production system, political and social economic context. So the research focus on the fields to farm and household scales. It first analyzes, and um, this is the part you have on, on, on the slide, which is on your right. It first so it first analyzed the drivers and locks in uh, to the adoption of agroecological practices by farmer. It then um, considered the workload and the nature of the work uh, required by these agroecological practices, which is the second point you can read. Um, and of course, we put the two in balance. On one way, uh, the, the productivity, the yields, the, the margin at full scale, and the labor organization which is required. Then it also um, uh, looks at food security and nutrition outcomes. And on this point, uh, it's also assessed um, by gender and age differentiated approach. And finally, uh, the social economic values of ecosystem services and the services associated to agroecological practices will also be assessed. So. Next slide. So this, for this project, during more than one year, a group of international specialists from agronomists, economists, sociologists have developed a common method that mixes qualitative and quantitative description and assessment of the farming system in a diversity of situation. And I, at the end, we came with 11 steps, rigorous description and assessment of farming system in a diversity of situation. This is what you can read in this slide. This method, is, this method has been designed uh, and will help the production of generic and specific lessons across SAT. So this is a question of evidence. Next slide. We've been working in detail uh, with a series of 12 case studies in 10 different countries representing very diverse production system and ecosystem. And each time um, it's with a local scientist that the studies were made. So it's completely country owned process. The result of this project will complete the toolbox of metrics and indicators and we'll allow just what Fergus just uh, underlined very importantly, comparing the performances of different forms of production of different kinds of intensification. And so therefore putting agroecology and conventional agriculture on the leveled field of comparison, which is lacking today. So it's a unique opportunity to produce evidences on the potential of agroecology to transform African agriculture. This project intends to fill this information gap. Next slide. Filling this information gap is very useful for a second question I'm going to develop with this project, which is called TAFS. It's the question of public of um, the policies and public policies. So TAFS, this project, aims at developing policies framework to support agroecological transition towards sustainable food system. This project, I want to underline, is not fully founded, so it's not the same level of development as the last one. We know that public policies are essential driver in supporting transition to agroecological food system. 
However, little is known about how these policies should be built to be efficient. And more, most research uh, today focus on, on the practices at farm level, but there is no generic framework to analyze how public policies might facilitate or hamper the agroecological transition. So this is what the TAFS wants to address. The main objective of the TAFS project is to provide policy makers and stakeholders with convincing arguments, new evidences, and ongoing experiences about adapted ways of promoting the necessary transformation through public policies, and these at different levels. The difficulty is that we know that each country is unique, and the question they have to address is very different. For instance, it might be uh, the need to reduce agrochemicals, agro it might be the need to strengthen ecological intensification of traditional production, which is the case in Africa, but it also may be to scale up scattered agroecological experience, just like it's the case in Brazil. Next slide. So the first step has been to design a common rigorous method to assess public policies in connection to agroecological transition in different contexts. This method is, is this time a six steps method and not an 11 one is concluded by what we call a policy dialogue. And this policy dialogue will help to formulate public policies, inform specific policy design and drafting principle fostering agroecological transition. Next slide. Has a reliability. Concluding now, Elizabeth. Okay, I just conclude. Just I wanted to, to, to underline that in this project, just like in the viability, it's a very large consortium with very large variety of partnership, and it's it's uh, continental with different continents involved. So, um, I would just like to conclude. This is an ongoing project, and we are still looking for fundings. That these two projects, these two examples, illustrate the TPP approach to tackle knowledge gaps. And this is a th a three points, and this is my conclusion. First, to gather the best scientists around an unsolved issue. Second, to define a common methodology. And third, to apply to a wide diversity of situation and context. And lastly, the, the goal is to generate useful knowledge, both specific, context specific and generic. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, and let me move quickly on to um, our uh, civil society mechanism representative, Perla alvarez Butez from Anamuri, the National Rural and Indigenous Women Organization from Paraguay, which is part of La Via Campesina, um, uh, and she's coordinator of the civil society mechanism working group on agroecology, which has been really involved in the uh, uh, CFS deliberations. Please, uh, Pela. Buenos días. Muchas gracias por la oportunidad de, del diálogo. Ojalá este fuera el espíritu con el que estuviéramos en este largo, o sea, en este breve tiempo de negociaciones en el Consejo de Seguridad Alimentaria con los gobernantes del mundo y donde el espíritu no ha sido efectivamente lo que estamos hablando aquí. Para empezar, diría eso. Y por otro lado decir que soy de CONAMURI, Organización de Mujeres Campesinas e Indígenas de Paraguay. Y nos ha sido bastante auspicioso poder tener esta oportunidad de dialogar. Trataré de ser concisa diciendo que la agroecología es una de las propuestas que venimos planteando desde los movimientos campesinos e indígenas del mundo. En Paraguay también no, no estamos ajeno a esto. Desde la CONAMURI y la Vía Campesina proponemos la agroecología como una respuesta a las diferentes problemáticas, no solamente sociales, económicas, sino también medioambientales. Entre ellas creemos que la agroecología es la que va a resolver los problemas del hambre, de la malnutrición y estos problemas climáticos que devienen justamente por causa de modelos eh, de desarrollo eh, rural, de modelos de desarrollo en el campo, que perjudican no solamente la producción, la productividad, 
sino también el medio ambiente y por tanto también nuestro bienestar humano. Entonces, eh, en ese sentido decir que la agroecología recupera nuestros conocimientos ancestrales, incorpora los conocimientos académicos y juntos lo, lo, la, la, la historia previa con la actual plantean eh, un futuro eh, mejor para todos y todas, para nosotros como seres humanos, también para, la, para nuestro medio ambiente, porque el, el, si nuestro medio ambiente está afectado, por tanto va a también eh, afectar la vida en la ciudad y por sobre todo en la ciudad se ve afectada porque lo que en el campo producimos se come en la ciudad. Si la ciudad eh, no entiende de que en el campo está su alimento, entonces es una cuestión que necesitamos trabajar para eh, establecer esta solidaridad, esta relación que existe entre la alimentación que se produce en el campo y lo que se consume en la ciudad. Quería yo hablar con relación al tema de la del conocimiento, de las brechas de conocimiento que estamos hablando aquí. Desde los movimientos campesinos vinculados a la vía campesina venimos hablando desde hace un tiempo sobre las escuelas de agroecología y en América Latina en particular tenemos las iniciativas como los IALAS, que son los Institutos de Agroecología Latinoamericana, con varias experiencias colectivas desarrolladas en Venezuela, en Brasil, en Paraguay, en Argentina, en, en varios, en prácticamente todos los países del, de, del continente estamos teniendo escuelas de agroecología en el que la juventud tiene una formación técnica recuperando estos saberes ancestrales, incorporando los conocimientos académicos que a su vez son resultado de la sistematización de las experiencias campesinas. Aprovechamos el, la metodología de campesino a campesino porque las personas que están vinculadas en las, están estudiando en esta escuela, nuestros educandos y educandas, están vinculados a los territorios donde se producen, eh, y no solamente producimos alimentos para nosotros y nosotras, hablamos de la producción de alimentos también para los animales, que después forman parte de nuestra base alimentaria, o también alimentamos a la tierra, porque estamos desarrollando abonos naturales que permiten la regeneración del suelo, que ha sido bastante destruido por el empleo intensivo y extensivo de agrotóxico, de semillas transgénicas, de tecnología de punta con mucho peso sobre la tierra, eh, el deterioro de, del medio ambiente que esto genera, está afectando por sobre todo eh, la salud ambiental y la salud humana y animal también, la diversidad biológica se está disminuyendo por causa de ese modo. La agroecología viene a ser esa respuesta. Hay una brecha de conocimiento eh, que necesita ser eh, potenciado, digamos. Necesitamos recuperar nuestro diálogo con la naturaleza mediante los estudios que nos permiten esta relación muy cercana con, con la naturaleza. Decimos nosotros y nosotras que el conocimiento ancestral, los conocimientos tradicionales de la agricultura, los conocimientos de la práctica eh, de, agrícola, pero no solamente la práctica agrícola, sino también los conocimientos del monte, los conocimientos del agua, de la pesca, que es porque nosotros como campesinos y campesinas somos diversos. Entonces, en ese sentido, creemos que ese conocimiento debe ser este, abordado en la academia y la academia tiene esta responsabilidad no solamente de reconocer, sino contribuir a su valoración, a su validación y a la validez de estos saberes populares por poner un ejemplo muy breve, desde hace muchísimo tiempo venimos hablando de que el modelo de desarrollo agroempresarial está afectando el clima y hay un, un calentamiento que nosotros percibimos en la vida cotidiana. Hay a, a aumento de las temperaturas y también periodos de lluvias eh, diferenciadas. Eso hace muchísimo tiempo venimos denunciando. Recién cuando la academia dice que ha alterado el, se ha alterado el clima, recién, sí, that, that, ya that voy cerrando. Can, yeah. recién allí es cuando se dice que el conocimiento tiene validez, entonces es que nos, nuestra experiencia pareciera que no tiene valor cuando la academia no lo certifica, entonces necesitamos esa alianza para poder potenciar estos conocimientos que están en, en, en el mundo campesino. Decir entonces que esta plataforma que se lanza hoy, creo que puede ser una herramienta poderosa para poder contribuir en ese sentido, que eh, puede potenciar los conocimientos, acercar estos conocimientos al mundo académico y difundirlas, 
creemos que las políticas públicas pueden ser una herramienta también importante para potenciar esa transición agroecológica, pero sobre todo restringiendo, eh, por ejemplo, el uso de agrotóxico en las comunidades. Dejaré por aquí y abierta al diálogo. Muchas gracias. Thank you, uh, and for reminding us that knowledge is power and that the power relationships around knowledge are critical in terms of agroecological transition. Let us move now um, to uh, Beverly, um, um, who is uh, um, Beverly Maguri uh, Chichiri, who is the founder of Maguri AgriVentures in Kenya, and is a young woman who's going to talk to us about uh, entrepreneurship uh, in agroecology uh, from her perspective. Over to you, Beverly. Good morning, good evening, everyone. My name is Beverly from Kenya. I am a farmer in Kajedo County where we work with marginalized community. Uh, we teach women on uh, agroecological practices here in Kajedo County. Now, um, one of the things that I want to talk about um, is that we know that agri agroecological is a viable agricultural business and we have been able to start projects for women. For example, we, we help the women to learn how to harvest water, even though it's a semi-arid place. So we don't have so much water. We also train the women how to inter intercrop different types of crops with animals like having poultry, farming and growing vegetables and also using renewable energy. Now, the biggest, I want to talk about the biggest challenges that we are finding in agroecological and my research is based on the ground, the things that we've been able to experience. And one of the things that has become a big challenge is the knowledge gap or lack of training on, on families. So for example, where I work, many, many women did not understand all these agroecological practices, for example, like uh, trying to solve soil erosion issues, growing trees or taking care of those trees. So that was a big challenge, people not being able to understand exactly what agroecology is. The other challenge that I want to talk about is um, introducing regenerative organic models to the farmers for example, you know, like I find it, it's becoming, it's expensive for, for example, in the rural setting to have all these um, equipment, let's say, for example, like hydroponics and aquaponics, we require water, we require different mechanical systems. And I think, and what I've seen is that as much as we want to do it and help the people, it's becoming, it's a bit expensive, but it's also manageable. The other, um, the other thing that I wanted to talk about is um, the quality management of agroecological practices, especially in Kenya and in the Saharan region. And this kind, what I'm talking about is the organizational strength in communities. The, I feel like they need to be a political will to allow communities to come together and understand things like uh, growing of trees or desertification, you know, many communities, they cut uh, trees for firewood here. And so they need, we do a lot of campaign to make them understand that they have to protect these trees so that they can control uh, the trees assist in so many ways in growing cover crops and controlling also the climate, the climate effects. The other thing that I've seen is behavioral society change. So for example, we are really trying our best to change the mindset of the people here to understand agroecology and to understand uh, safe agricultural practices here in Kajiado County. And that takes a long time to, to make sure that the, the community understand exactly what we are doing. For example, we are assisting families, every family to have a small chicken, a poultry farm, at least with 20 chicken and not more than that and then assist them to start harvesting water, assist them to learn on, on cover, crop, cover cropping and soil tillage. And that 
has taken a long time to for people to really understand and see the fruits of agro-friendly practices here in Kajiado County. The other thing, um, I mean, there's, 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 we can talk about so many problems, but also I see agroecology as a big uh, opportunity for business here. For example, we are em encouraging youths here to grow, like to start doing aquaponics, where they can also grow strawberries and they can also keep fish here. So we can say that yes, there are challenges, but also there are very many advantages of practicing agroecological uh, uh, practices here. So I want to talk also about um, another challenge that we are facing here is technology and the production of biological control um, practices here, for example, like fertilizers. Uh, you find that uh, not so many people could be able to afford to, to work or to practice, to have the biological control. For example, we use garlic here to spray our crops to keep pests away so that we don't use fertilizer. And sometimes those kind of crops are expensive and sometimes many people cannot be able to afford. So if those things are a bit cheaper, so many communities could be able to practice agroecology. Also mechanization and you know, like um, if you can be able to get like a cheaper way of mechanizing tools for these people, it's, it's going to solve a lot of problems because we also have to ensure that we are not stealing the soil so hard. We have to be soft on the soil so that we, we continue to preserve um, the soil fertility. Yeah, so those are the few things that I wanted to bring about in case there's any question I'll be able to answer. Thank you so much, uh, Beverly, for that uh, very on the ground experience uh, in Kenya. Um, now, uh, what I, uh, uh, we, we um, are very tight on time. We're going to have a summing up by the chief scientist uh, from FAO. Uh, but before that, let's get some, some, some audience involvement. I think, um, uh, Fabio, that we've got um, a, a couple of questions which we can uh, put to the audience for the audience to be able to um, uh, uh, try to express their view. Uh, Fabio, could you put the first one up? Yep, exactly. So let me launch the poll. So here you've got a question. Where do you think there is most demand for agroecology? From governments, from farmers, from civil society, from consumers. Um, now, all of you can vote. Um, uh, uh, and uh, you should see that on your screen. You tick the box that, that you think, uh, which one is the most important. And Fabio, where do we get to see the results? As soon as we close the voting, we can see the results. So I'm gonna give it another maybe 20 seconds, 20. And by the way, if you're a panelist, you can't vote. So sorry, folks, you've had a chance to speak you don't have a chance to vote. This is for the audience. Uh, yeah, so please okay. uh, make sure you've, you've, you've made your vote. And do we have the results, Fabian? People are still voting at this time. So ah. I'm going to give it another five seconds. Five, four, three, two, one. So I'm going to close this poll. And here we go. Okay, so here are the results. I hope you can see them. Wow. So uh, civil society is, is uh, by far the uh, most frequently selected. And then farmers, governments, and consumers last. So one of the agroecological principles of connecting consumers and producers really needs a little boost if, if this is an accurate, uh, an accurate reflection. Can we go to question two? Um, uh, Fabio. Yes, let me let me trigger this. Okay. All right, here we go. So question two, very simple. You've only got two options, so it shouldn't take long to vote. What do you think is the most limiting factor for transformational change? Knowledge gaps or implementation gaps? I'm going to be really interested in the result on this one. Uh, and really frustrated I can't vote myself. Um, so please vote quickly. 
And don't tell Fergus what you think should be the no, answer. I, I'm <laughs> keeping mum on my view. Um, how's the voting going? Yeah, they're, they're still voting. Okay, I'm going to give it another five seconds. So make your, pick up your choice. Five, four, three, two, and one. Okay, I'm closing it. All right, let's see the results. There you go. Wow. So uh, again, quite a, a, a clear um, um, uh, result with uh, two thirds of people um, thinking that implementation gaps are the bigger problem. Um, and I guess it must be the researchers there who think it's knowledge gaps. Um, I guess these interact quite strongly together and that some of the reasons that, that there's a problem in implementing some things is because um, um, we don't know how to do it uh, 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 as well as um, other things. So the binary element is a little bit um, simplified. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Fabio. Um, we have very short space now, because uh, I want to give uh, five minutes uh, um, for, for the wrap up. So we've literally um, uh, got uh, three minutes, or two minutes, in fact, in fact, probably not enough time to do any sort of justification to the huge number of questions that's coming in on the chat. Um, we will make sure that all these questions are answered. Um, those that we haven't been able to answer either in writing or through um, the, the, the discussion, um, we will answer in writing and post um, um, uh, in the future. You can join the uh, TPP web platform uh, and somebody will put in uh, the chat uh, the information on how to do that. And that's a way that you can keep connected to the TPP uh, and how it develops. Uh, I'd like now to ask um, uh, the FAO uh, chief scientist, Ismahani Elouafi, um, to sum up um, in five minutes. Ismahani, the floor is yours. Nice, easy job for you. Very easy job. Thank you so much for me. It's a really very, uh, it's a pleasure for me to be with you today. So good afternoon, good morning, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. I'm a really honored to be here with you to conclude this important event on a very topical subject that is really making the news uh, over the last few years. I especially want to acknowledge my fellow contributor to their, for their excellent speeches, presentation, and insight. We have heard and discussed collectively the need for a transformation of our agri-food system to become more efficient, more inclusive, more resilient, and more sustainable. The contribution of agroecological approaches to achieving the 2030 agenda by applying locally adapted solution for agri-food system that are environmentally sustainable economically fair and socially equitable is increasingly recognized. That is why the FAO conference requested the further integration of sustainable agricultural approaches, including agroecology in FAO work. I think acknowledging agroecology as a dynamic concept that has gained prominence in science, in policy, and in agricultural governance in recent year FAO developed the 10 elements of agroecology that Fergus has mentioned and many of you uh, pointed to as an analytical framework to support agri-food system transformation. This is facilitated through the scale up of agroecology initiative where FAO brings together government, private sector, academia, research and civil society organization to rethink and redesign agri-food systems around sustainable principle and institutional innovations. Agroecological practices at the plot, farm, and landscape, landscape levels can lead to increased farmers' income, improved food security and nutrition, more efficient use of water, 
more efficient use of soils, conserve biodiversity, it can reduce pest via biological control, restore landscapes, provide ecosystem services, and integrate crop tree livestock system for better nutrient recycling toward creating a circular and solidarity bioeconomy. But the results are fragmented, owing to heterogeneous methods and data, context and differing spatial and temporal scales. A tool for agroecology performance evaluation called TAPE has been developed by FAO to assess the multidimensional performance of agroecology and is currently being tested in 29 countries globally. So as uh, Ambassador Pugh said, we need more data. We need more evidence. We need more research, particularly in different ecosystems. I couldn't agree more with him that we cannot copy paste when we talk about agroecology because there is so many variables and we need that data at the ecosystem where the research is done or when the scaling up is done. FAO commands the recent negotiation held in the fora of the Committee on World Food Security as an example of inclusive and constructive policy dialogue among members that will shape an important path forward uh, towards sustainability. In this regard, the resulting policy recommendation on agroecology and other innovative approaches for sustainable agriculture and food system that enhance food security and nutrition will be a vital tool. Ladies and gentlemen, the potential of inclusive collaboration to accelerate and catalyze the work of agroecology partner at international, national, local, and also territorial level is now well articulated. After today's rich discussion, we recognize the need for further research and collaboration, co-creation and sharing of knowledge if we are to bridge the knowledge and implementation gap on agroecological transition. And Fergus, I was really also uh, a bit uh, frustrated that I couldn't vote because I, I had my own views on it, but I was happy to see that we all recognize that we have both a knowledge gap and an implementation gap, even if the percentages are a bit off. To promote and scale up agroecology globally, international and local organizations from academia, civil society, and private sector must support countries and relevant stakeholders in promoting for agroecology-based products and services. And I think the mention of the price and the true price that we need to pay maybe for certain commodities and certain food. It's a very relevant discussion that we need to have. Through the newly established transformative partnership platform that you presented on agroecology, FAO will actively engage in inclusive collaboration with different stakeholders to transform agri-food system for better production, better nutrition, a better environment, and a better life leaving no one behind. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm looking forward to meeting you all in the next fora on promoting agroecological approaches. And sincere thanks to all the speakers and the panelists for their passion for the subject and the information they shared with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ismahani. And it just leaves me, uh, um, uh, we're, we're right on time. So let me thank uh, the Forestries and Agroforestry uh, Consortium Research Program of the CGAR for doing all of the background organization of this, uh, this event at C4 ICRAF, where, where it is based. Um, it's been a huge effort in the background, and you know, the people in the background never get, uh, never get seen, but they're what make things happen. So thank you to all of the people involved and to all of the participants and to all of you in the audience who voted, there's a really rich chat. The recording of this event will be made available for you. Um, you can join uh, the GFLX platform, and we really look forward to a productive um, and exciting uh, development of the TPP with all of you over the next few months and years. Thank you very much, everybody. and. 
uh, uh, goodbye for now.